Hello everyone, today I wanted to talk about the absurd claim that JF seems to be making in his stream talking with a feminist. This piqued my curiosity since I hadn't heard from any feminists who uh, were in touch with JF, so I thought I'd just check it out. It seems to just be a random Twitter user I'm not familiar with, and uh, I didn't agree with everything she said in the stream, but I think she overall did a pretty good job. His first question in this stream is to ask her if race exists. I believe this question is meant as a trap because we all know what JF means when he says race exists is going to be very different to what a normal person means. When I say race exists, I mean race is a social construct which refers to physical characteristics such as your skin colour and other phenotypic traits. When JF says race exists, he seems to think that race is a biological construct that determines your criminality, IQ, and so on. Ten guesses to who he thinks the low IQ criminals are. That's right, white people. One example I would give of how race is socially constructed is where we look at mixed race people. Barack Obama is widely considered as a black man, but if race made sense, he should be considered mixed equally as white as he is black. The fact that mixed race people who are half white and half black tend to get excluded from whiteness shows that whiteness is an exclusionary social label while blackness tends to be pretty open. This is why you see a lot of provocative sounding articles that say things like white people are over or something. I understand why some people dislike the packaging of this message, but it is important to keep in mind that they aren't talking about white people as individuals and more about whiteness as a construct and as a label. I'd also like to add a disclaimer in here that I do realise that some things we consider indicative of race like skin colour do have genes responsible for coding these traits, and I'm not saying that genetically we are going to be 100% the same and there are no indicators whatsoever of race on a genetic level. What I'm arguing though is the very specific claims about the weight of these differences between people and the specifics about voting tendencies and IQ. I'd also argue that I don't think you can group people as simply into a group that you'd call black because I feel like the genetic diversity among black people is similar to, to that among white people and it all kind of, it's, it's not like, we can't really be lumped all together like that. Um, as another example, I want to present you with these twins who look rather remarkable. One would pass for a black girl and one could pass for a white girl, but both girls are mixed race. There are similar cases of twins turning out with different skin colour, and so this is yet another example of how race is socially constructed. The red-headed girl being referred to by people as white, despite her sharing at least half of her genetics with her twin sister, is just proof that this isn't really about somebody's genes if you say that they're white or black. I would have thought it was transparent that these supposed race realists are just racists hiding behind so-called science to essentially call black people dumb criminals, but unfortunately a lot of people have been taking this very seriously as of late. This sort of begs the question, if this science is so incontrovertible and factual, why is it only far-right lunatics who seem obsessed with it? Is it possible for a scientist to be ahead of their times and going against the grain? Yeah, sure, that's possible, but somehow I doubt that Jean-Francois Gariepi is this generation's Galileo. See that Daily Beast uh, journalist? She's Jewish, so uh, genetically, she's probably right here. And I'm non-Jewish, so genetically, I'm pretty much right here. The, the Daily Beast journalist, the Daily Beast. And JF is here. I'm genetically distinct from you, you liar. And I'm fucking Hispanic woman. Whoa, great revelations. In this stream, he goes on to ask a few more questions. Next, if IQ is in part genetic and that you cannot educate someone into a higher IQ beyond their genetic limitations, First of all, I'd argue that there is actually evidence you can uh, educate, um, you can basically get people to have higher IQ than what they initially had. So I'd also point out that IQ is not nearly as static as people seem to think it is. There are limitations set by genetic factors, broadly speaking, but the environmental factors on IQ are also incredibly important and shouldn't be brushed off. For someone to deny the environmental factors or just skip over them like JF does is just showing this is a lot more 
more about ideology than it is about actually being scientific and following the scientific method. Also, if we deal with this just on a non-statistical level, we can clearly see a lot of black people who are articulate and highly intelligent. Really, the biggest indicator of having a higher IQ is most likely going to be your access to decent schooling, nutrition, and a whole lot of other factors, things that JF doesn't even mention. To delve more into environmental factors, it seems to be something that skeptics generally like to dismiss because they seem to think it's less scientific than strict biology and genetics. How they came to this conclusion is beyond me and shows that none of them really have any background in science because ignoring environmental factors is unscientific. In my opinion, I think JF knows full well he's not being scientifically accurate and he just doesn't care. I think he's just pushing a narrative and he doesn't care how he does it. What I mean earlier by environment setting limitations on biology, if we just put ice IQ aside for a moment, there are environmental factors that are definitely going to have biological consequences. Radiation is technically an environmental exposure and radiation has biological consequences. UV radiation, for example, causes cancers when exposed to too much, can cause skin damage in general, or can give you nice vitamin D. Gamma rays are ionizing radiation, which are mostly lethal. Smoking can cause genetic mutations, and so on. These are all environmental, so before dismissing everything in someone's environment, please take some time to consider how environment can actually impact genetics too. To get back to IQ though, there are some factors that have been strongly linked to IQ that are entirely environmental. My first example would be nutrition. Eight-year-olds whose diet has been low in fats, sugars, and processed foods by the age of three averaged one to two points higher on IQ tests, even when compared with children who switch to a healthier diet after age three. I would also like to point out that IQ can actually increase if you change certain environmental factors. As I mentioned, nutrition is one that can actually improve IQ scores, exercise, learning mathematics. Uh, check the description for a few more articles on that. For more on IQ fluctuating, this article from Stephen Sessi, Professor of Developmental Psychology at Cornell University. An article in November in the Journal of Nature by Price and her colleagues is one example. It had 33 adolescents, who were 12 to 16 years old when the study started. Price and her team gave them IQ tests, tracked them for four years, and then gave them IQ tests again. The fluctuations in IQ were enormous. I'm not talking about a couple points, but 20 plus IQ points one way or another. These changes in IQ scores were not random. They tracked very nicely with the structural and functional brain imaging. Suppose the adolescence's verbal IQ really went up during that time. It was the verbal areas of the brain that changed. There are quite a large number of other studies showing IQ can change. Many of the changes in IQ are correlated to changes in schooling. One way that school increases IQ is to teach children to taxonomize, or group things systematically instead of thematically. This kind of thinking is rewarded on many IQ tests. If you put it all together, and the evidence is quite compelling, that life experiences and school-related experiences change both the brain and IQ. This is true of adults and children. And here's another quote from Business Insider. Scores can change gradually or quickly after as little as a few weeks of cognitive training, research shows. The increases are usually so incremental that they're not immediately perceptible to individuals, and the intelligence-boosting effects of cognitive training can fade after a few months. While there are some limitations of IQ that we can say are genetic, I don't think that the science is nearly as about nature versus nurture as it used to be. People trying to pry these two apart is like trying trying to take an egg out of a cake batter that's already been mixed. I would also like to point out that in most conventional approaches in science, today we don't really try to separate nature and nurture. To quote from Dr. David Retchie, child psychologist, Today, most scientists who carefully examine the ever-expanding research base have come to appreciate that the nature and nurture domains are hopelessly interwoven with one another. Genes have an influence on the environments we experience. At the same time, a person's environment and experience can directly change the level at which certain genes are expressed, a rapidly evolving area of research called epigenetics, which in turn alters both the physical structure and activity of the brain. 
Given this modern understanding, the question of nature versus nurture ceases to even make sense in many ways. This attitude that genetics is a primary determiner of everything is very old-fashioned, and it seems to be the approach that JF has in a lot of the bold claims he makes. If you still aren't convinced by Dr. David Rech here, got another source from goodtherapy.org. Many scientists eschew the debate by emphasizing nature x nurture. In this schema, nature and nurture are inseparable. Some genes, for example, cannot be activated without certain environmental inputs. The development of vision is a prime example of this. People cannot develop normal sight without exposure to visual stimuli. Below I'll also provide a link to The Guardian where they speak to Queensland researcher Babin Binyamin. In short, he explains that genetics and environment are both important when talking about heredity and we can't just isolate one of these and examine it. Science isn't about making bold black and white claims. So whenever you see someone who claims to be a scientist making very bold claims like that black people are genetically left wing or genetically criminal, you should be skeptical of this person. Even if he were to manage to find a twin study where two black Black people raised in different families both turned out to be criminals, that doesn't really prove that black people are genetically more likely to be criminal. There are other questions like rates of poverty, as poverty is an indicator of criminality, lead full of education, are there other environmental factors that you're ignoring, like exposure to lead, so on and so on, were they brought up in a really rough area? Jeff never really seems to bother to engage in any of these questions, and he just makes the most simple racist conclusions you can from the data he has. In summary of this, whenever you read something from reputable scientists, you'll always see language like the evidence suggests or this indicates and not our study proves without a shadow of a doubt that eating apples every day will prevent cancer. I'll reference a post by Forbes where they actually quote Jack Fraser about the term proof. Proof implies there is no room for error, that you can be 100% sure that what you have written down on a piece of paper is 100% representative of what you are talking about, and quite simply that doesn't exist in the real world. I cannot prove to you that electrons exist. No number of scientists in the world can ever prove that the stars are far away, or that Higgs boson exists, or even that the Earth is round. But shh, don't tell the flat earthers that. Nobody can prove that things will always fall down when you drop them. Nobody can prove that energy is conserved. Nobody can prove that dark matter exists. Nobody can prove that quantum physics is real, because that's not what science is about. Proof can only exist when there is no doubt, and there is always doubt. You could be a brain in a vat living in a crazy simulation. You could be hallucinating everything. Now, maybe this sounds a little silly to you, but science is not about making bold claims, then finding evidence to back up those claims. That's what confirmation bias is. If you're looking for statistics or studies you could present to say that white people are superior, you'll probably find so-called evidence for this claim. The problem is you're also ignoring huge amounts of evidence that contradicts your claim then also ignoring extraneous factors which could be infecting the results. With many alt writers, they take it a step f further, ignoring entire chunks of studies they cite and isolating just a few sentences. With the wealth of data, if you're selectively choosing your data, you could make almost any argument, provided of course you don't really care much about honesty. IQ isn't something totally unaffected by environment and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. While there are tests we can be certain of in people, even if the results for black people people were poor for IQ, this doesn't mean that they're always going to be bad or that the black person can't ever improve the results of an IQ test. I've already provided evidence that IQ absolutely can be improved. Where I disagree with JF is he is essentially making the claim that black people don't have the same threshold potential for intelligence as white people. I just don't think at this point in our society we could ever really make that claim either way. Um, I'd also like to point out the, the Flynn effect. I suggest you Google this. They sort of don't like when you bring this up because they go, oh yes, of course you're bringing this up again. But it's that IQs have actually been increasing over time. So given that fact, isn't it possible that things would level out, or maybe white people's IQs will plateau or just stand, stand still and black people's IQs will increase still? Uh, we don't know what could happen in the future, that's my point. 
Um, another point I want to make is that someone's IQ score really isn't inherently indicative of their value as a person or their value to society. JF will claim that this isn't his standards of what he wants in people who live in his country, bringing up his so-called ex fiance uh, who's intellectually disabled. Then he'll go along and say that the IQ of black people is super important in excluding them from society. It's basically doublespeak. I've seen him on one hand say he doesn't care about IQ, but then he'll also turn around and say it's a good reason to exclude black people from America. I also would be willing to bet if the race realist types were to take an IQ test and have it beneath 100, they would not be arguing that they should leave the country or not breed. The problem again is that their ideology is one which would keep all white trailer trash, as they're called, and evict someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson just because of his skin colour when he's clearly more intelligent than the average person, let alone white people. <laughs> I also would like to make the point that even if it was true that black people had low IQs, I still think that it's unethical, irrational, and frankly disgusting to then conclude that black people don't have a place in our society with everyone else. I'd also say it's hard to know the full potential black people could meet, because currently so much has been done to screw them over and subvert their communities, and with that much damage it's going to take some time to recover. Just because the oppression they faced and are still facing today is making a lot of them struggle doesn't mean we should just give up on people and conclude that they can't be helped. Not enough has actually been done to help black communities to thrive. In fact, the opposite has been done. The drug-related laws passed under Bill Clinton had devastating impacts on black families, with black people being locked up more for marijuana use and possession, despite the fact that white and black people in America smoke weed about just as much as each other. Those drug-related laws were not even that long ago, so until the American prison system is fixed, until we don't don't see the same segregation of communities that we did during Jim Crow, I don't think we could say anything conclusive about race and IQ in Americans. I should think that the fact that Obama and Michelle are clearly intelligent people with intelligent children should prove that class, wealth, and education have a massive impact on intelligence and that it's not really about race, but it seems that sort of talking point might be a bit too hard for JF and his buddies to address, so he'd rather just gloss over it and go straight to misrepresenting numbers. Another the part of this stream I wanted to talk about is JF multiple times implies that black Americans are genetically left wing. I believe a genetic link is being implied because of the constant mention of twi twin studies. I'll quickly sum up what a twin study is. A twin studies where two twin siblings are isolated at birth, preferably comparing fraternal and identical twins, and then testing for something. In this case, we'd have a pair of identical twins who share 99.99% of their DNA, and fraternal twins who share about 50% of their DNA, so basically like siblings, and the purpose is to try and isolate for genetic factors because the environment of the twins is different. So back to the stream, JF says that if you were to make a bet about a black American that they support Democrats, you'd be right 85% of the time. First off, there has been recent controversy over voter ID laws in America, which has proved to have targeted black voters to suppress their votes. I realize a lot of you watching this think this is some SJW nonsense and you don't believe a word of what I just said, so I'll provide you some evidence. The Supreme Court of America determined that voter ID laws were targeting minorities and were an attempt to suppress votes. This is a quote from Jerry Herbert the director of voting rights are uh, redistricting at, a, at the Campaign Legal Center. The Supreme Court rightfully rejected taking up a review of North Carolina's voter suppression law today. This case serves as a sobering reminder of the continuing fight to protect voters from discriminatory voting laws that legislators too often enact with the purpose of burdening minority communities. This was one of the most restrictive voting laws in the country, passed in the direct aftermath of the loss of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, so it was a huge victory for both North Carolina voters and the country that the Supreme Court will not review the Fourth Circuit's decision striking down these restrictive laws. Another quote from a document about this from the Brennan Center, the court holds that SB 14 creates an unconstitutional burden on the right to vote, has an impermissible discriminatory effect against Hispanics and African Americans, and was imposed with an unconstitutional discriminatory purpose. The court further holds that SB 14 constitutes an unconstitutional poll tax. Another point I would like to touch on is just the general anti-black sentiment seen on the Republican side. I recognize, of course, that Democrats have their own problems with race issues, 
but I do think it's safe to say that at least the Democrat, the Democrat Party is perceived to be better about race than Republicans. I highly suggest reading Calvin Wade's Let's Debunk GOP Myths of Why Black People Vote Democratic. Check the description for a link. This writer opens with a quote from Jeb Bush that he would give black voters hope, not free stuff. Citation also for this in the description. The idea being shared by Bush here, whether intentionally or not, is that black people just want free stuff and as if they aren't hard-working people. Before people flip out in the comments, I will say that it doesn't really matter if Jeb Bush considers himself racist or not, or if he was even meaning it to sound like that. Unintentionally racist comments are still racist comments nonetheless, and I think people should be accountable for these things. The point I am making is that insulting a part of your voter base by suggesting they're freeloaders who don't want to work for anything, it's not going to help you win an election. The subtext of what he's suggesting here just makes it sound like he thinks black people are just lazy. To continue and quote from Kel Wade, this idea that Democrats earn minority votes with free stuff is an article of faith in the Republican Party. In 2012, Newt Gingrich said blacks should want paychecks and not food stamps. Rick Santorum said he didn't want to give black people someone else's money and that they should earn their own. And then there was the GOP presidential nominee Mitt Romney blaming his defeat on President Barack Obama giving gifts to blacks. Calvin Wade also points out how the Republican Party notably has a very state independent approach, at least this is how they sell their party. Given that historically black people have been screwed over by state law, it is understandable how this could alienate a black voter. I want to make the case that I think that black voters have been alienated by the Republican Party and that if the Republican Party wants to be elected, it is their job to convince the populace, including black people, to vote for them. It is ironic that conservatives will act as if black people feel entitled to things like welfare, and yet they feel entitled to votes from black people. What is truly absurd about JF's claims is that he seems to act as if voting for a political party is some innate biological thing, but actually political parties are supposed to convince the voting populace to vote for them. That's democracy. What JF really should be advocating for is for the Republicans to stop alienating black voters by suggesting they're all lazy and want to be showered in free gifts. The fact that this is made about race is also silly because about half of white people vote Democrat as well in the United States, so even if America was 100% white, there would still be a huge number of Democrat voters. That's about all I wanted to say on this subject. I have links in the description for everything, and I believe I've done my best to summarize JF's points. Ultimately, I suspect he's going to back down from some of his claims or try and act like he wasn't suggesting these things are genetic. But if you watch the stream, I feel like it's pretty clear what he's hinting at. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye!